I've got some, I hope, nice pictures to show you. Um, this is one of my favorite photographs of, uh, uh, I'm going to say his English version, Satyajit Ray, rather than Shotujit Ray, I think you'll understand. So I'll say Satyajit Ray. Um, one of my favorite photographs of him. Uh, it shows him highly alert uh, behind his cameraman uh, in the busy streets of Calcutta in 1956 while shooting um, his second film, Oporajito, which is the sequel to Pate Panjali, uh, you're going to see tonight. And after he'd been shooting these scenes, he wrote to a friend in London, uh, we had the toughest time shooting our Calcutta street scenes and it's left me quite exhausted. And the photo was taken by uh, Marc Ribou, um, who's a celebrated French photographer, uh, who used to work for Magnum Photos. And Ribou sent it to me um, uh, very generously, along with some other pictures, while I was working on uh, a big uh, photo book about Ray called uh, Satyajit Ray, A Vision of Cinema, back in 2005. And I think it captures uh, rather nicely what Ribou's friend, the, the classic photographer Henri Cartier-Bresson, uh, called the drive, the alertness, and the profundity of this giant of cinema in all his majestic stature. Uh, Cartier-Bresson wrote that um, on Ray's 70th birthday in 1991. And here are four more photos taken by Ribou um, at this time in 1956, and they show them in show Ray in various moods from highly active to distinctly meditative. Um, there he is directing, uh, sweating like, like crazy in the Calcutta heat. Um, there he's buttoning up uh, Opu's shirt, his main character. Um, and there's a somewhat different scene. He's on location. Um, watching a train in the distance, and you'll know there's a train, famous train in, in Pate Panchali. Um, and um, I love this photo too. This uh, is um, him sitting, just thinking, on location uh, with a child in the background. And I think this photo reminds me um, of what Ray once said to me about creativity. Um, he said, to me, this, this whole business of creation, of the ideas that come in a flash, cannot be explained by science. I cannot. I don't know what can explain it, but I know that the best ideas come at moments when you're not even thinking of it. Uh, it's a very private thing, really. That's what he said. And I think he felt this was true of his creativity, whether he was script writing, designing, directing, editing, or composing music, uh, all of which he was intimately responsible for on his films, unlike most film directors. Um, he, he, I show him here uh, playing the, uh, composing on his piano at home in Calcutta in 1982 for a much later film, The Home and the World. And he was intensely musical. Um, now his first film, Pater Panchali uh, was shot between 1952 and 55, uh, and Ray was then an art director in advertising in Bengal, and he had no experience of filmmaking. Um, and while he was shooting, uh, trying to get his project off the ground, in 1954, um, the Hollywood director, John Huston, turned up in India um, to search for locations for his film, The Man Who Would Be King. And when he was in Calcutta, Houston watched some silent rough cut um, of Pata Panchali, which was shown to him by this unknown young man, Ray. And Houston knew almost nothing um, about Ray, um, but he was, he was hugely impressed. Uh, and we know this because he enthusiastically um, recommended the uh, footage and the film to the New York Museum of Modern Art. Um, and in 1955, the museum had the world premiere of, premiere of uh, Ray's Pata Panchali, which launched him. It was his first uh, screening of the film. He had to finish it very, very quickly in order that it could be screened in New York. Um, and it was then shown at the Cannes Film Festival in 1956. 
As you may know, it won a prize, a special prize for best human document. Uh, and in a letter I, I was lucky to, to receive from Houston, just before he died in 1987, he wrote to me, um, I recognised the footage as the work of a great filmmaker. I liked Ray enormously on first encounter. Everything he did and said supported my feelings on viewing the film. I like that last bit. Uh, the letter appears in um, my biography of Ray, which The Inner Eye, which Kerry just showed you. Uh, it was first published ages ago in 1989. Um, the newly uh, published third edition is coming out this year to commemorate Ray's birth centenary. Uh, and there's the cover so that you can see it for yourself. Now, um, over the decades after the 1950s, Ray and his films won admirers among leading directors and film critics all over the world, including the great Japanese director, Akira Kurosawa. Um, and I actually got to know Kurosawa uh, through mail while I was researching the book, and he used to send me Christmas cards, which he designed, which was rather delightful. And in the 1970s, Kurosawa said, um, not to have seen the cinema of Ray uh, means existing in the world without seeing the sun or the moon. Uh, 91, um, while Ray was still alive, just the Hollywood uh, Academy um, gave him an award, uh, an Oscar for his lifetime achievement. Um, and that was the very first Oscar he'd ever received. He'd received dozens of other prizes, but not an Oscar. And then he died um, shortly afterwards in Calcutta in 92. Now this year, I'm pleased to say that Martin Scorsese, another leading American director, um, following on John Huston, um, he made a comment on Ray, which he sent to me. Um, and he's admired Ray's films since he was a teenager, uh, back in the early 60s, um, in a New York family, um, before he ever became a filmmaker. Um, and he had sent me this rather heartfelt message, I think, in May of this year. Uh, he said, when I saw Pate Panchali for the first time, it opened my eyes to the lives of the people who had historically been placed in the background of Western movies. Now that alone was meaningful, he says, but it never would have had the impact it did without Ray's extraordinary artistry. Whenever I take a fresh look at The Music Room or Charulata or any number of his other films, which I do often, I see another value, another dimension of feeling. His body of work has become increasingly precious to me over time. And then he concludes, the films of Satyajit Ray are truly treasures of cinema and everyone with an interest in film uh, needs to see them. So that's Scorsese's view. Now tonight I want to focus on Ray and his French connection, um, or this afternoon, because this was vital to him. Um, and I'm going to sketch right now five connections between Ray and France and then come back to them in a little more detail later. Um, the first is Jean Renoir. Um, now Jean Renoir inspired uh, the novice Ray um, when he was still an advertising uh, director to make Pater Panchali. Uh, and he influenced Ray's entire oeuvre probably more than any other film director, according to Ray himself. Uh, second, um, Cartier-Bresson, Henri Cartier-Bresson. Um, this is a postcard that Cartier-Bresson sent me um, in, uh, just after Ray's death. Uh, and you can see that he, he, he was greatly admiring of Ray. Uh, thirdly, um, detective films. Um, now this is something Ray started to make in his mid-career, detective films. Um, they're not so well known in the West, but this one, The Golden Fortress, um, is very popular. They're very popular in India, very, very popular. Um, and I mean, I'd go so far as to say they're more popular than Pata Panchali and the Opera Trilogy. People really love his detective films. And they were colored by his affection for 
Tintin, Tintin um, which he read a long time ago when it first came out. Um, so there's another French connection. Um, and then there are these two films which he made later in life. This is the fourth connection. Um, the feature film, Branches of the Tree, um, at the end of his life, and a short film called Piku, which is not so well known. They were both financed by French companies, including the actor Gérard Depardieu, who's shown here with Ray uh, in, his in his house in the 1980s. Uh, and finally, fifthly, uh, Ray received um, the Légion d'honneur award um, from the president of France uh, in Calcutta in 1987. But now I'm going to just say a little bit about Pater Panchali, uh, and then we'll come back in more detail to the French connection. Um, it was probably his most famous film uh, throughout his lifetime, and probably is still his most famous film of the 30 films he made between 95, between 55 and 1991. Uh, the story, as you probably know, is set in a Bengali village, um, and it stars the boy, Oppu. Um, and Oppu is materially poor. Uh, he has no money, and he's formally uneducated, but he's very sensitive to the natural world and to the people in the village. And he has an equally sensitive elder sister, uh, Durga, uh, who is both a friend of Oppu and his rival. Um, and their mother uh, is Shorbojaya, and she makes up for her lack of education uh, with her practicality and her devotion to her children. And that's uh, a shot you may have seen before. It's from the film, and it's uh, Shobrajaya on the left, uh, Udoga in the middle, and Opu on the right. And it's become known as the family of man um, because it was included in a photographic exhibition organized uh, by the Museum of Modern Art in New York in 1955 called The Family of Man. And that exhibition toured, uh, and there were 68, 68 countries contributed work to it. So it was a worldwide thing. And then it toured the world uh, for eight years with tremendous response from audiences. Now, there's also a father figure, um, Horiho, um, who's Opu's father. And th this is Horiho with his uh, wife, Shobrajaya, collapsed on the ground. Uh, he's a Brahmin priest, um, and he's a would-be writer. And he's formally educated, unlike his wife and children. And he's always struggling, though, to provide uh, food and shelter for the family. He's a bit of a dreamer, and he soon becomes an absentee father because uh, he leaves the village in search of work and income uh, in an urban center. And when he comes back, uh, finally, um, he discovers that a disaster has struck his house and his family. And that's shown here in this grief-stricken uh, scene with the wife. There's also one other character I'd like to mention, um, the elderly great aunt India. Uh, she's a distant relative of Horihor, and she's uh, an extraordinary uh, performance um, on the left, and Durga giving her some fruit on the right. Um, and she's constantly, India Takurin is constantly in search of food in the village because she does not receive enough to eat from Sharbhajaya, who, the mother, who regards India as an unwelcome scrounger in the house. Uh, so she's got this desperate feeling. And Durga pities her, uh, her great auntie, and she finds ways to feed her. Um, and the next photo I'm about to show you is by Ray's art director. Um, and it's a lovely shot. It shows Ray rehearsing um, Durga, uh, sorry, uh, Indi Takrun, uh, the elderly auntie on the, left, on the right, and they're obviously having quite an interaction. And I, I can't give you any details, but even though she was 80 years old, she had a fantastic memory for details, more than he did in some respects. Um, now, it's based on a, a novel, this film, uh, published in 1929, 
um, written by Bibhuti Bhushan Banerjee, who's um, a Bengali writer who grew up desperately poor in a village north of Calcutta. And Ray read it as a young man, and he became hooked on it in 1944 uh, because he was asked to create a children's edition um, with woodcut illustrations, an abridged children's edition of the novel. And he was a, a very capable illustrator, even as a young man. So he started work on it, and he became more and more passionate about it uh, as he worked on the abridged edition. And this is one of his woodcuts. Um, it shows Dugga spotting a railway train uh, for the first time in her life in the village, uh, outside the village. And this became, as you may know, one of the most famous scenes in the film when Opu and Dugga together run across a field to see a train which passes by puffing smoke. Wonderful scene. Now, Ray's fascination with this novel, I think, gave him the idea of making the film. There's no question about that. But he was, in the 1940s, an art director in an advertising agency. And he had no opportunity to train as a filmmaker. And he had no experience. And he didn't have any money to finance a film either, because um, he was the son of a single working mother. And he lost his artist father. Um, when he was only two years old, and, and he was far from wealthy. He was struggling for a long time. And then, in 1949, Jean Renoir came to Calcutta from Hollywood in search of locations for a feature film uh, called The River. And they first met uh, at a hotel uh, where Renoir and his wife were ensconced. And Ray didn't know how to meet Renoir, but he eventually plucked up the courage and he sought him out in the hotel. And then he wrote an article uh, for a British magazine just afterwards about meeting Renoir. It's a wonderful article. And in this article, he says that Renoir was not only approachable, but so embarrassingly polite and modest that I felt that if I were not too careful, I would find myself discoursing upon the future of the cinema for his benefit, um, because Ray was a passionate filmophile at that time, even though he never made a film. Now, he subsequently joined Renoir uh, and the wife on several trips to locations um, outside Calcutta, both in a car and on foot. And during this, these journeys, he was able to answer the majority of Renoir's questions, a real barrage of questions, apparently, because um, Renoir's curiosity and his energy, uh, everyone says, matched uh, his age, or he was able to overwhelm his age and his dimensions. He was a big man. And uh, Ray could hardly keep up with him at times. Um, and apparently, Ray, uh, Renoir found Ray's knowledge of the West fantastic. That was the word that one of Ray's Bengali companions used about it. But his approach to this great man, this great French director, was also very Anglo-Saxon, very correct, according to another amused Bengali companion. Um, so he was always rather respectful. When the two of them finally met again in Hollywood in 1967, many years later, at a screening of The River, the film made by Renoir, um, they were brought on stage together after the screening, and they were introduced with the following comment, Ray owes a lot to Renoir. Um, but Renoir responded to that immediately by telling the audience, I don't think Ray owes anything to me. I think he had it in his blood. Though he's very young still, he's the father of Indian cinema. Now, there's no doubt that meeting Renoir changed Ray's life because... Renoir's attitudes to both life and filmmaking, uh, and particularly to Ray's own idea of making Pate Panchali, which Renoir encouraged him to pursue, um, they appeal to him, these things, in, in, to Ray, in their, in their wholeness. Um, after Renoir's death, Ray said, um, there are some Renoir films which can be seen over and over again, and we can still discover new and fantastic things in them, like a piece of good music. 
I think the same could be said of Ray's best films too. You come back again and again and find new things. But the two of them, Ray and Renoir, never became close as people. I think I, I need to make that clear. Um, there's no photo of Ray with Renoir. I've looked for it, everyone's looked, but there isn't one. And there are no published letters between them. There may be letters, but there are no published letters. Uh, and much more surprisingly, there is no reference of any kind by Renoir to Ray in his uh, autobiography, a somewhat an absorbing book, but somewhat sad book, I think, called My Life and My Films. There's a whole chapter on the river, but there's no reference to Ray there. So they were not all that similar as personalities, but I think the point is that the young Ray recognized in Renoir a real uh, self-taught, that's crucial, self-taught film artist. And this was the first such artist he had come to know personally. And this he drew strength from for his own struggling film project, uh, from the knowledge that such an artist actually existed. Now, he wrote of Renoir's work in 1982. There's an almost, um, there's a subtle, almost imperceptible kind of innovation that can be felt in the very texture and sinews of a film. A film that doesn't wear its innovations on its sleeve. A film like La Règle du Jeu. Humanist, classical, avant-garde, contemporary. I defy anyone to give it a label. Uh, that's the kind of innovation that appeals to me. Um, and this is, uh, I'm sorry, I meant to show you Renoir shooting the, the, the river um, in, in, in India in 1950. And this is um, a uh, still from Renoir's La Règle du Jeu, showing Renoir acting as Octave in the, in the film, on, 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 of course, on the left. Um, as soon after he made this comment about La Règle du Jeu, Ray went even further. He told an Indian interviewer, um, I think subconsciously I've been paying tribute to Renoir throughout my filmmaking career. And when he received the Légion d'honneur in 1987, Ray said to the French president uh, that he'd always considered Renoir to be my principal mentor. That was what he said. Now with Henri Cartier-Bresson um, and Ray, there's... Again, no photograph of the two to men together, and that's ironic, but you probably know that Cartier-Bresson hated to be photographed, and he avoided it if he could. However, Cartier-Bresson never took a photo of Ray, and um, Cartier-Bresson wrote to me charmingly, please forgive me for being such a bad journalist. Um, I enjoyed so much speaking to Ray each time I met him that I completely forgot to take a snap. Now, there's am ample evidence of their, their mutual respect. Um, after Cartier-Bresson's death, um, his photographer wife, Martin Franck, um, said that uh, Henri was particularly fond of Ray's film, The Music Room, uh, which was a 1950s film that had been revived in Paris in 1981 with sensational effect. People really woke up to Ray in France after The Music Room. Um, and Martin said that Henri used to watch it again and again, uh, many, many times, each time with fresh enthusiasm. And just to remind you, if you don't know the music room, there's the, um, the, the landlord who is rich and obsessed with classical music uh, and who loses his life eventually in, with his, because of his obsession. Um, and there's a shot of... Ray directing the music room with uh, Roshan Kumari, the dancer, um, in the studio in Calcutta. They built the music room in Calcutta. Now, Ray actually saw Cartier-Bresson's uh, photographs in the French magazine Verve in the 1930s, and he, he immediately became an aficionado of Cartier-Bresson. And then he came across more of them in a slim volume produced by the New York Museum of Modern Art in the 1940s. And then finally, he saw uh, Henri Cartier-Bresson's classic volume, The Decisive Moment, published in 1952, which was the year he began shooting Pater Panchali. And this featured many photographs of India, uh, such as uh, this one, um, taken by Cartier-Bresson, um, 
showing a, a merchant in India in Jaipur in 1948. And these photographs do remind you of these eccentric village characters in Pate Panchali. Um, now, in the 1980s, uh, Ray wrote this foreword to a uh, exhibition catalogue called Henri Cartier-Bresson in India, which greatly pleased Cartier-Bresson, um, as you know from his postcard I showed you. And I think you can see why if I tell you what Ray wrote. It's rather wonderful. He said, Cartier-Bresson's style is unique in its fusion of head and heart, in its wit and poetry. The deep regard for people that is revealed in his Indian photographs, as well as his photographs of any people anywhere in the world, invests them with a palpable humanism. And then he adds, add to this the unique skill and vision that raise the ordinary and the ephemeral to a monumental level, and you have the hallmark of the greatest photographer of our time. And I asked Ray once, well, did Cartier-Bresson's early photographs help him with his first film, Pate Panchali? And Ray said, um, yes, up to a point. His available light attitude to photography, that's what he emphasized, uh, that helped me. I don't think a still photographer really influences a film to that extent, but Cartier-Bresson's feeling for light, the fact that he never used flashes, um, it was the spontaneous quality, said Ray, of Cartier-Bresson's photography and the fact that he was using available light as far as possible. That's what influenced us, or influenced me. He occasionally used reflectors to boost the shadows, but Ray said that's unavoidable. Uh, otherwise, you have extreme contrasts of light, which is not very pleasing in a film. But he used the reflectors in a way that people would not be conscious of. So he learned from that. Now, Ray's fascination with child characters is obvious in Pater Panchali, even from what I've told you already. Um, it begins with these woodcut illustrations of the novel for children, um, but it's also evident in some lovely uh, sketches that Ray created for the film in 1952 to try and get uh, Bengali producers to, to, to fund the film. Um, his fledgling film. And he later deposited all these sketches in the Cinematheque archive in Paris. And there's a charming example uh, of one of them um, showing um, Opu and Durga chasing the train through the field. Now the fascination, I think, with children increased in many of his later films, um, perhaps especially his detective film, The Golden Fortress, I referred to earlier, made in 1974, um, where the adult detective, Felu, is assisted by a very bright teenager. Um, and by then, Ray had written many stories for children uh, in a children's magazine in Bengali that he used to edit. Um, and he was also a keen fan of Hergé's Tintin uh, adventures. He first came across Tintin um, while serving on the jury of a film festival in Brussels in 1958. And when he was leaving the festival, the organizer came to see him off uh, at the airport, presumably, and he asked him, do you have a child in Calcutta? And he gave Ray a copy of the French edition of Tintin. And Ray's small son, um, who later became a film director, was very young, he was fascinated uh, by it, in spite of the fact it was in French, which he didn't know. And then two or three years after that, Tintin appeared in English in Calcutta and became a very successful um, thing, as it did everywhere in the world. Uh, and Ray said to me, Tintin is definitely a very, very filmic approach, very original. I like it very much. Um, it's possible that it was at the back of my mind when making The Golden Fortress. And the book does appear in the film, so there's a clue um, that it was an influence. And even those two blundering villains of, in Tintin, the Thompson and Thompson, uh, the, they may have subconsciously influenced um, the, uh, the, the film, according to Ray. He wasn't so sure about that, but he said Tintin definitely is an influence. 
Now, there's certainly uh, one other child character I'd like to mention, uh, this creative boy, Piku. Um, he's the same age as Opu, more or less, and he's in the center of a short film made by Ray, not so well known, called Piku, in 1980, made by, um, financed by a French um, television company uh, at the behest of the freelance producer Henri Fraise. And there's, there's a still from the film showing Piku drawing in the garden uh, in Calcutta. And the producer, according to Ray, he was, being, he was joking, but he said the producer briefed me as follows. He said, you make a film for us. Doesn't matter what kind of film, you can place your camera at your window and shoot the house next door. We will accept that. That sort of instruction, and Ray laughed. Now, unfortunately, um, this lovely poetic film, uh, it's not been seen much outside France, uh, but whenever it is shown, people love it. It's very touching and um, very emotional in a complex way. Now, finally, in 1989, Ray received um, a totally free-ranging French offer, like Henri Fraise's, from um, two other figures in the French industry. He said, it's a carte blanche. Uh, he's, they said, make any feature film of your choice. And the two people who made the offer were Daniel Toscan du Plantier um, of Irato Films, who was an opera lover who'd produced Joseph uh, Lowe's Don Giovanni, and the actor Gérard Depardieu. Together they, uh, and he owned a production company, together they uh, were passionate admirers of Ray, and they said, make us a film. So this shows... The Minray's house, Depardieu is in the center, Ray is on the right, and the, the, in the window is Duplantier. And they're making this rather lively uh, one hour French television documentary on Ray, in, uh, for showing it in Paris and in France. And you, you, if you ever see it, it's quite funny because uh, it's very animated, uh, but Ray is rather bemused by some of the uh, being asked questions in Franglais not in English or in French, but in Franglais, and he's replying in his usual impeccable English. Now, the producers said, make us a film. So he did make a feature film. It was completed in 1990, uh, his second to last film. It's called uh, Les Branches de l'Arbre, uh, The Branches of the Tree. And it's probably, I have to say, his most pessimistic feature film. Brilliant in places, but it's a bleak, powerful family drama set in Calcutta, and it's in some ways reminiscent of La Règle du Jeu in its direct criticism of the wealthy. And it was described to me, Branch of the Tree was described to me by Cartier Bresson in a message as being of distressing beauty, which I think is quite accurate. And that's a still from the film, uh, a dinner, a family dinner where they violently argue um, about black money and corruption. Um, now, Depardieu compared Ray's films with Mozart's music. And Mozart unquestionably inspired um, this intensely musical man, Ray, from his teenage years during the 1930s right up to his final year. Um, in his last year, 1991, he made a radio broadcast uh, for the bicentenary of Mozart's death. Um, entitled What Mozart Means to Me. And there's no doubt that the ensemble performances in Charulata, um, his 1964 film, which Ray thought was probably his own best achievement, there's no doubt these were inspired by uh, Ray's love of ensemble singing in Mozart's operas. And there's a, uh, a lovely shot from Charulata showing the heroine watched by her husband's cousin, who's fascinated by her. Now, in 1964, um, Ray compared Charlie Chaplin's 1925 comedy film, uh, The Gold Rush, to Mozart. He said it has distilled simplicity, purity of style, and impeccable craftsmanship, reminiscent of Mozart's The Magic Flute, and he called the magic flute the most enchanting, the most impudent, and the most sublime of Mozart's operas. And I think these are qualities that are hinted at uh, in my final 
picture uh, of Chaplin uh, sketched by Ray uh, back in 1953 in, while he was making Pate Panchali. And I think the qualities that I've just mentioned, the, the enchantment, the impudence, and the sublimity, they are true. They are evident of Ray's finest films. Not all of them, but the finest films, including the one you're going to see. Uh, and they, they're certainly evident in the portrayal of the villagers in Pate Panchali. So I think, just to finish, maybe this undoubted genius, Mozart, is the most appropriate comparison for Satyajit Ray a century after his birth. Despite the fact his films are thoroughly Bengali, mostly, and he lived in the Bengali atmosphere, I, I think we could argue he is the Mozart of cinema at his best. And I hope you enjoy um, seeing Pata Panjali. I hope you're enchanted by it or re-enchanted as you probably, many of you have seen it before. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>